Application Services Student Research by Richard Self. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much. This is actually sort of looking at how what we we've, we've been looking at in some of the projects I've been supervising for the last year and a half now, and it's led to some very interesting consequences of giving the students this is the topic I'm going to supervise, and then seeing where they take it. Um, it kind of works around the fact that actually I don't have to do very much research myself. I just do a little bit of investigatory stuff here and there, and then the students rush off and do all sorts of fun stuff. And then it leads to publications, as several of us in what do, we publish their work, uh, they get the reputation, we get reputation as well, which is interesting. Now, what happened was, going back a little bit in time, and I noticed a few things going oddly with um, location services uh, recorded on my iPhone 5C. Um, the first bit was this one. I was standing still in TK Maxx there and realised a little bit later on it had taken me for a walk for about three minutes across to Boots and all the way back. That was in the middle of other things. I was using Maps Plus app to just see where I, where I thought I was going. So I thought, that's interesting. I'm stationary like that. And I've gone for a long walk. Quite fast as well. Also, um, around about the that time, I'd also, it turns out, looking backwards in time, I'd rebooted my wireless router at home. And for a few days, at night time, my phone clearly went for a wander, about like that, 450 metres away at night time. Which is kind of interesting because if I had got a, one of the GPS tracker bands, because I'd got a sort of police wanted to know where I was, this would have been unfortunate when I was down there at three in the morning. And then, um, this is August 2014, and I was at a um, conference in Santiago in Chile, and we were down there and having a rather lovely meal, and I took some photos of each dish as it arrived, because they're really beautifully presented. And then when I got back and to the hotel and connected up to Wi-Fi and it did its thing, I discovered I'd got a couple of photos 22 kilometres wrong. So I thought, hey, this is kind of interesting. This gives me a changing type of project for students where they don't have to do technostress um, questionnaires, which is kind of iffy and a bit difficult. And they can collect data because it's so easy to collect lots of location data using one of these whether it's iOS or whether it's Android or whatever. And we can get lots of data, not of this 20 questionnaires, which is kind of a bit boring and not very significant. But hey, we can get 200, 400, 600 photos with EXIF data, latitude, longitude, and we can do something interesting. So I thought, well, that tells me I can do an interesting project next year because there's actually not much data out there about how accurate location services are on these. Um, and the final one was last year in around about June, I was over in Montreal, I went up to the top of Montreal, which is, I think it's about there somewhere, and took a photo right on the very top, right next to the uh, radio mast, which is about 100 or 2 feet tall, and took the photo of this on a Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, I think it was, and four and a half, four, nearly five kilometres error, perfect satellite visibility, perfect everything, and it was miles off. I actually went back up uh, later on in the, day, uh, in the week after the conference had finished for the flight and took a series of 50 odd slide photos over a period of 20 minutes every half minute. The first one there was actually only a kilometre and a half wrong. But kind of interesting. What's going on? What's the interesting implications? So I, last year I had 12 students uh, working on this, and this year I've got five, and they're doing some different stuff this year. These seven are ones who I've been talking about at conferences from SAS Global Forum last year, uh, who actually co-authored a paper with me. They contributed something like 2,460 data points. I've got lots more now. They, these guys collected that data, and three of them actually provide such interesting insights for the paper that they co-authored the paper. Their names are there as co-authors on that SAS Global uh, presentation. 
Now, if you go look on the websites of things about GPS, always claim it's 95% accurate or fixes are within 10 metres or less. You'll have seen the posters outside my office, well, the Think Near posters are three quarterly posters which suggest actually reported locations are nothing like that accurate. As used in uh, online advertising to mobile apps and so on. <coughs> Look at that one. That's kind of interesting. 10% of the number of the data that Think Near have looked at is over 60 miles in error. Now that has governance implications for the people trying to advertise, because it's going to have reputational damage. You're advertising that I'm near your shop, and you think, no. I'm in Derby and you're advertising it up in Sheffield or Manchester. This is not good for your reputation. It gets us upset. Well, our data shows 42, 60, 40, 20. 85% of readings, and they've taken readings inside buildings, in houses, in shopping malls, outside, down in the car park, uh, all over the, the countryside. And we've even got some which I haven't yet consolidated into that down in Dubai. But I'll be consolidating those later on. But the ones I've consolidated, 85% are accurate within about 25 metres. The really worrying bit is that the two and a half percent which are less accurate than 500 meters. <coughs> and I've now got a data point in a set of four, five where the first photo is 1800 <coughs> kilometers wrong. I haven't claimed those one, that one there because that was a really naughty tricksy one. But the fact that the next four in the next couple of minutes were sensible positioning kind of shows that things go wrong in the startup phase. Lots and lots of different uses. This is going to be really interesting because not far from here, and Dave knows the road beautifully, the Via Gelia. How many know the Via Gelia? That is probably the most dangerous road I suspect in Derbyshire, or one of the most dangerous. Ecor isn't going to work there. There are no satellites visible. There's no wireless, there's no cell phone, no nothing. So eCall will not be able to send a call home to the emergency service saying there's a crash. Transport fleet management, they've come up, oh, we, and we have one of our students there fairly regularly at a company out near Ilkeston who do fleet management, uh, GPS tracking and so on. But there's all sorts of interesting uses, and one of the things we're beginning, we'll be getting into very shortly is using location data from various different sources to help plan transport infrastructure, knowing what source and origin, where people come from, where they're going to, what routes they cluster into, and you can actually start looking at how the traffic flows, how people flow around cities and around the country. And I've seen various presentations at conferences covering that stuff recently. So lots of uses where most people seem to believe that GPS is 10 metres accuracy most of the time. As it happens, it isn't. So we have some interesting governance questions. What is the reliability of this data? What's its repeatability? And particularly for businesses, what are the consequences when we don't know the veracity of the data set we're collecting. <clears throat> and it's particularly bad with single points. It's not quite so bad if you're putting a uh, collecting a journey set of data. <coughs> but there are consequences. And so this is why I think it's quite important we start doing this. And we're the only university, the only people who've ever collected even 2600 and analyzed them from the perspective of accuracy. There are a couple of other data sets I've come across very recently with huge amounts of data in journeys they've been used particularly for this sort of stuff. They've not actually started thinking about well, how much of those data points are accurate and what the consequences if they're, mis uh, if they're inaccurate and by how much. So what did the students come up with? Farandy came up with a lovely one. He went out into the car park one day, <clears throat> stood between four parked cars on a on the white uh, intersection of the line. 
at a point which he could go onto Google Earth and identify very precisely which one it was and therefore what his latitude longitude was from Google Earth. And he did it with a car park full at that height, that height, and that height. And then another day, when there weren't any cars around that patch, those three. Nice accuracy, 10 metre accuracy there, or 10 metre error, which is within the bounds of what we use the force. Low, low down, so high up here, 100 metres, so lots of reflections. Medium there. <coughs> 400 metres, down here, a kilometre. He was somewhere over there or there, who knows where he was. Now, an interesting thought, of course, is where do uh, police allegedly put GPS trackers <coughs> when they're trying to track them? Kind of down there underneath <coughs> wheel arch. So it's kind of interesting, because that's a beautiful Faraday cage environment. So how do they track you around the road? It's kind of interesting thought to me. Amna did something interesting. She decided she'd take about 15 sets of photos <coughs> in 15 locations, but she'd take readings every half minute or every minute. Startup error. It just does something and then it kind of refines itself. And this was a surprise. In all of her set of 15, there was this split somewhere between six and ten minutes. It suddenly go woof, wildly out of kilter. And then it would settle down again. Uh, you know, there are one or two other ones which I haven't picked up on here, but those are the three really important ones. There are also ones about uh, model numbers, so there's our HTC, Desire S, and HTC M8 which are two generations apart, <coughs> incredibly different profiles of accuracy. Hugely, the more recent one, um, the M8, was much more accurate and a much, much closer pack. The standard deviation was much, much less. The Desire 8 was about, 50, about 120 meters accuracy average. This is one I took from home. I took about 15 photos, pretty much one after the other in our back room which should be something like about there. The first eight, all down 450 metres away. Then it overshot coming back, and you can see the, it varies. I colour-coded it to the error, the level of error. Amber is not so good, green is within about 10 metres. And this is one where I was standing, and I can say I was at that point very, very accurate. I knew exactly where I was standing. My feet were growing grass, and I was standing there going every 30 seconds. Very, very good visibility, apart from the trees around on the sort of west side. Start-up error, 4,900 4, metres on a Sunday. I've had a look in Excel, done a few things. And you can see how this is moving around. Um, each of these, the, that's about 10 metres, so while I'm standing there, it's just going for a gentle wander. I haven't actually connected it to where I'm truly standing on this particular one. I've got some more work I'm just doing at the moment. More interestingly, GPS in your cell phone picks up because it's using four, typically four or more satellites. It can tell you how high you are from ground sea level. Start up, I was 186 metres. Quite an interesting journey over time. You can see it sort of coming, moving up in steps. At the end, when I got bored after 25 minutes or thereabouts, and my feet were very, very cold, I gave up. I thought, I've got enough data. I've got probably two cycles of satellite positions. So I was up at 204 metres by then, or sorry, pick up. The phone thought it was 204 metres. Actually, I was standing at 231 metres. So, out of all of this, if you've got the triplets, X, Y, and altitude Z, <coughs> the question is, you've got a, a set of data flowing through, like I had from Montmorel. How can I identify the rogue, read, rogue readings, the ones which are 
truly spurious, which are going to cause reputational damage for businesses or could foul up some of the um, work that people are trying to do to locate traffic and traffic both in people terms and in vehicle terms. And if you ever watch yourself come up the, the train from London in the old style carriages which don't have the Faraday cage effect, you can get good tracking all the way up from the pancreas to here, but you're still either side of the railway most of the time by anything from 20 metres to 50, 60, 70. It's okay if you're on the railway because you know you're stuck to the rails. But if you're on the roads and you think about, say, GPS tracking for uh, congestion charging, charging, an error of 20 or 30 metres could put you either inside a high, band, a high charge rate or a low charge rate, which is spurious. So the two areas, one is can we answer the question of single point analysis, kind of tricky. Is there something we can do for a time series, a movement, a journey? There's also questions about um, anonymity and privacy, because if you're doing a lot of work recording people's journeys and movements, if they're not careful, they will start at home, finish at work, finish at the office, leave there, come back home, go on a journey, get to somebody's place, and so on. It's actually very easy to reverse engineer within six to eight houses where people actually live, if you're not careful. So there are kind of data protection issues, um, and then there's the question of aggregation. Many uh, people who are doing this sort of work say we have to be able to aggregate at least five to avoid having too many uh, reverse engineering back into people's homes. So, Location studies have some interesting challenges. Answers. Well, that single point at the top of Montreal, if I've just got that report, it, with no other context, it'll be very, very difficult to identify that it is 4.9 kilometres of drift or not. Now, if you've got a whole series of photos from my camera for that, you could have, for the second set on the Wednesday afternoon, where the first startup error was one and a half kilometres, you might have been able to detect that the previous photo was taken 600 metres away down the hill a bit, and kind of come to some sort of conclusion that it was unlikely that I could have moved that far that way when I was actually going up that direction, and then a set of following on. One of the things we're starting to look at, and I'm getting one or two of the master's students doing business intelligence with SAS, is trying to look at some of these things. Can they identify mechanisms to actually look at a journey and see what's going on? One of the things I've looked at is the velocity and acceleration vector. So I'm not looking at the, the vector um, in the sense of I've got a distance and a direction, or speed and a direction. I'm actually looking at it in the x and y latitude and longitude individually, because that kind of is helps you to get at what's actually happening. This is actually quite interesting. This is a set of data that Microsoft um, Asia collected over a period of research between 2007 and about 2011. It's a big, big data set called GeoLife because they collected it from smartphones, 182 volunteers, Overall, something like 17,000 journeys, a total of about 1.5 gigabytes worth of data. So now we're getting some interesting size data for students to play with. I found just this one little one, about 70 records every five seconds. And you can see one or two interesting odd blips. <coughs> No surprises for the first 10 seconds, because that startup error, while the GPS, the city GPS is kind of sorting out what's happening, where it is, what it's doing, and then it refines itself. A little blip here, and then at the end of the journey, down about a mile and a half of a light railway in Beijing, suddenly it all goes fairly haywire. And you can see <coughs> suddenly quite significant velocities in that's one and a half meters a second, which is three, four, five miles an hour, which is um, at that point. 
So I then started looking at what's going on if I plot in the east, west, north, south. <clears throat> and you can see some things happening here. And there's a, something, there's some, one of those points, that one there, looks as though it's wildly out of place in a visual uh, picture. All the other 80 odd points are nicely clustered around there, and then suddenly there's that one violent movement of back. So I thought, okay, that's velocity, let's have a look at something else. What's happening in terms of acceleration? And as we can see, again, lots and lots, most of the data is sitting at sensible levels of acceleration for a human or for a light railway. That one and that point are getting towards unreasonable levels of acceleration over a period of three to five seconds. That one there at, is very close to <coughs> 0.8 meters per second squared. That's getting to levels which are uncomfortably high. Now, it could be, and, but remember, these are measured over intervals of five seconds. Right. So it's not a 0.8 which is like that, mm. but it's that for five seconds. I've got other ones there, um, and where we can see that there's uh, up as high as a half a G. And that's really not reasonable on the railway, because the coefficient of friction of steel on steel is about max out sort of 0 0.1. And so we can begin to start looking for that to see how <coughs> we identify the road points and discard them, perhaps. That's what we're really trying to get at. So uh, this is one that the MSC students are now having a good go at. They've got 17,000 journeys, that's 17,000 files, so they've got to learn how to load, or automatically load, large numbers of files into SAS from multiple folders, 182 folders and 17,000 journeys. That sort of accurate uh, intervals, mostly five seconds. So the one I found which is a rather beautiful journey from the far west of uh, China, Kashgar, all the way across the top of the desert that at five second intervals, the whole thing has three or four thousand, maybe more, uh, data points in the three files that hold together. <laughs> by train or by plane? Car. You can see it going round the road. You can see, you can actually put the data point onto Google Earth and see where it is. So there's this GLF life on where, and the, the guys who are researching, you can find a little link from there, um, the whole group of people who have been writing papers and, and producing presentations uh, about using the traffic flow around Beijing to identify things like social network, social impact and social activity, uh, a whole lot of stuff like that. But they haven't looked at it from the perspective we're looking at of accuracy and diagnosing errors and problems. Accidentally, I discovered something rather odd about both Bing Maps and this one is Google Earth, Google Maps. Whereas here, in the UK and in America, we're used to having the road overlays exactly overlaying the images. That's Beijing. That's where the railway actually is on the satellites. That's where it is on the map overlays. These are accurate. The image is accurate. The map is massively out. And on Bing, I can't even work out what the level is. It's, it's a different error, but it's even bigger in China. So here's an interesting sort of bit of research that other students could do, which is a good thing, obvious. And you can actually see there's also one way you can actually check that the, the image for that road, which is not actually on top of itself. It's about 100 meters error there. So that was an accidental sort of serendipity uh, discovery. On this one, here is the journey which went down that railway. And you can see it's pretty much OK. A gap of readings here. By eyeballing it, you can probably guess that that reading is probably wrong, because it, the person's got off the train there and is walking around, probably going to walk across the pavement and under off the railway, under the bridge, 
and to there wherever there is. So plot it like that. Now this becomes the interesting one in terms of the sorts of uh, velocities that it's doing. You can see it got onto the train all going southwards quite neatly at about. What's that? Uh, two, uh, 20 metres a second down there. And then you've got some really wild, wild ones at in sort of spurious points. Look at the acceleration factors here. That's half a G. That's not quite half a G in the opposite direction. As the, as the, as the signal or measured GPS point jumps around. Spuriously. Is that an individual measure or is that aggregated over uh, some time? These period? are individual measures, remember, at five second yeah. intervals. Ah, right. So mostly it's what sensible levels of acceleration at you know, point one. Um, there may be one or two where the train accelerates up and gets going at somewhere around what sort of maybe these ones here. I haven't actually tracked them, color coded them or, or whatever to, to that level. So I'm just trying to find out what could I identify, find a visualisation that helps me to identify some of these odd readings when the satellite <laughs> installation or Wi-Fi or whatever else kicks in and it makes it go odd. So at least three points, maybe four, maybe five, maybe six points out of that 78 are a little bit out of position or a lot out of position. And the nice thing here is you can see this Acceleration that way, followed by an immediate acceleration in, in the opposite direction to get back onto to the, where it should be. So what's all this doing for us? Well, it means that the students, our BSC IT students, are getting noticed. They're contributing joint papers at SAS Global Forum last year. More interestingly, in a sense from the university's perspective, is we're now one of the big, uh, kind of a go-to university about location searches, accuracy, location searches, governance. So there are four conferences I was invited to last year to put give papers on it, and I got four this year to also give papers, mostly in London, um, but they want to know about. Um, one of them actually is an all-expenses trip to uh, Barcelona in end of April um, to talk to an invited audience of the CEOs and the CXOs of big retail organizations <coughs> in Europe. So we're beginning to, having accidentally tripped over and but seen the importance of a topic, got the stu undergraduate students particularly to do some interesting research which collects data that no one else has collected and analyze it in ways that no one else has collected, giving us quite interesting impact outside in the big wide world. So where to? First of all, I've got five or so students doing their dissertations this year, and they're looking at, having identified the broad issues last year, they're now looking at some rather more refined ones. And so one of them is actually looking at, does it matter which way up a phone is, or which is the orientation, upwards, downwards, facing that way, east, west, north, south, and so on. And the first pass of the data suggests that, yeah, it matters a little bit which way up. <clears throat> One who's starting as a January starter might be doing something like, um, <clears throat> does weather affect the accuracy and by how much? The current MSE IT and big data science students <coughs> doing in SAS with, uh, BI with SAS have been given the totality of GeoLife and told to go do. Do something, find out some interesting insights. One's wanting to look at whether you can identify so a good place to do advertising. Uh, another one is kind of thinking around, because it's kind of interested in sport apparently, Maybe go and look at Google Earth, Google Maps, Google something to find out where one or two uh, sports stadia are in Beijing. Find out their lati uh, where they are, and then start trawling the data inside those, those 17,000 journeys over five years to see whether we can identify 
some journeys which go into and out of that area, <coughs> see what happens, see if you can see when events happened. And there are various other things they can be doing with that. And then we all know, I'm not going to mention it on tape, on video, we've got various potential partners coming in to look at location data at various different levels from cell phone levels to various other ways of collecting journey data uh, from large samples uh, with the ability to then develop interesting advice, consultancy for transport strategy development uh, and things like that. So, quite a lot of interesting stuff been going on. Students started doing most of the work, students still doing most of the work. I just do a few every now and then when I see something vaguely interesting, do a tiny little bit, SAS or Excel, just to see what the interesting areas are likely to be, and then go point students at that to do some interesting stuff. Okay folks, that I think is a lot in terms of what I want to say to you about how we can use our students to really generate an awful lot of interest outside the university. Over to you, questions. So, um, satellite navigation software on a whole, because it tends to have a, a series of points, um, usually tracks you quite well. As so, a sat nav? Uh, yeah, the sat nav. Yes. So, uh, aren't the phone manufacturers using those algorithms to make sure that their individual snapshots are more accurate? What happens inside a sat-nav is they use snap-2 logic. So <coughs> the signal works out you're on this road, is going to keep you on that road. Even if the measurement says you're 20 yards that way or 20 yards that way. And if you watch a sat-nav as you, um, well, say you suddenly decide you're going to leave the motorway here rather than go straight on it. It knows you're going down the motorway and you watch your tracker and it takes you down the motorway and suddenly the area's too big, I must be on the slip road. And they got to Now, I came across a really fun one up in Yorkshire uh, a year or two back, coming down from the north. And there's a near ferry bridge, and around that sort of area, there's a new piece of A1, which is 100, 150 metres, maybe a bit more, to the west of the old road. I was coming down the old one, or the road, and then it sort of swings away off to the west a little bit, is a new dual carriageway. I was watching the sat nav at the corner of and it's still got both roads on the, on the map there. And it took me down the old road when I was on the new road, 100 metres apart, for the best part of 20 30 seconds. And it's something, oh dear, A, the road's empty, and B, I must be on there. If you watch your sat nav when you're coming up to roundabouts, it counts down. How often do you actually get? So a countdown of zero at the point you're exactly where you should be at zero. It's always 5, 10, 15, 25 metres, either early or late. That's the fundamentals of the way the satellites move around. One of the reasons I suspect why the altitude is bizarre is because due to the geometry effect, if the satellites are very high above you, then you're going to get more accurate, probably more accurate um, timing of the altitude, but that will give you less accuracy horizontally because they're all up there, whereas the accuracy for horizontal accuracy is they need to be spread out around the horizon, which will give you very, very little knowledge about how high you are. There are all sorts of trade-offs. The phones also use not pure GPS. They, start, they try to use GPS to start with, but there's an interesting stack. Um, if you only have GPS like the sat-nav, it takes anything up to two, three, five minutes to kind of get started. Because the bandwidth is so low from each of the satellites, which says, this is the time, and by the way, here's some adjustments to my orbit. It takes 12 minutes for that message to come from each satellite. And assisted GPS on, on a mobile phone says, if I, as long as I've got internet connection through 3G, 4G, I'll slip sideways to the servers on the cell uh, network and get the ephemeral status, so I can actually get an accurate reading within a minute or so, a half a minute, which is why you get the startup problem. <clears throat> and then below that stack, 
they will use the cell location if the, on occasion. So they can actually say, like, I can kind of triangulate slightly. Uh, then below that you've got Wi-Fi and Google, Apple, and uh, probably uh, Microsoft by now, have gigantic databases of every IP address that their phones have sniffed and, and have worked out. It's probably there, but we're not entirely sure. And they do that with Bluetooth as well, for Bluetooth beacons, and build a great data set. So if your phone says, oh, I can smell this Bluetooth beacon, this ID, they'll send a message off to their Apple or Google Maps or whoever, and say, this, this ID, where is it? And it'll come back to your phone. So it refines. That's why you, if you've got an iPhone and you switch off your Bluetooth, it'll say, by the way, you switch your Bluetooth back on again, you get better location. And so if you've got Bluetooth devices at home, they're always transmitting, you're going to be feeding all of those back to whoever. Um, but it's not very accurate. I mean, at home, if I'm in my front room, I look at and take photos there or readings there, I'm never in that part of the house. I'm always at the other side of the road, one to five doors up or down the street. Mostly up the street, actually. The area tends to be on my phone around home, northeast, southwest. At the back of the house, quite different. In the kitchen, it's with the Nats Whisker. It's never up the street, never down the street. Which is kind of interesting. I have noticed, actually, that there is a difference between what Google Map in, on the iPhone reports and the Apple, which is Thumbtop. And sometimes they do vary greater. Oh, and then why they show you on the... Exactly. Yeah. In fact, if you put an address on one, <coughs> you might get a, a totally different route and location. Yeah. Or that that's, part, that's not necessarily so much the GPS. If you're feeding in a postal code or a, a, an address and saying where, it, where is it on the map, that's because of all sorts of other different things. It's not to do with the GPS side. Where, I mean, I, I have not having used Android, uh, Android devices, I don't know quite how that works differently. But if you have a, a GPS or a latitude longitude calculated by this gadget, they're going to put you somewhere, probably, similarly on those two maps, I suspect. I'm not sure, I haven't actually looked at Google Maps on my iPhone for a while, based on just the, where am I. I don't think I see big errors there, comparatively anyway. I mean, one thing which is interesting with, with, with that is to compare um, site opening is designed for hiking and things like that, because they, have, they make no... Um, they have no connection with the road network at all. They don't use the information at all. But the other interesting part about that is because the the the, the timing, different um, the, the the measurements of timing required to do effective location finding in GPS are so fine that in some ways you do get what you pay for. So in that sense, the sort of the 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 chipsets that are included in all mobile phones are fine. But for example. The, the the temperature of the of the silicon of the chipset has to be and the thing doing computation has to be controlled because the difference in in the speed of um, of of travel of, of, of electrical signals on the substrate is different in that creates a different enough variant um, change in uh, timing readings to actually affect the the final location reading. So, which is why one of the reasons why, if you have you know, something like a, a, a set of things designed for hiking, they're like two hundred fifty quid, because they, they, they or they follow the the law of diminishing returns. Is you know they say, yeah, people who buy these will be willing to pay five times the price for, ex, for extreme accuracy, and that's also why they may have antennas that are sort of this big, I mean, they're just really enormous, in that sense. But you. But they work. The, the the profile of accuracy for them is far different than you would get from mobile phones, which is. But you even set then you still got the problem that even in perfect visibility on the top of Mount Tor or somewhere, you still only got plus or minus ten meters accuracy, ninety five percent of the time, with the standard yeah, GPS yeah, yeah. signal yeah, release. Yeah. 
usually. Okay. Although, although even those, I mean, with um, um, if you just straight up solve the location equation, yeah, that's what you end up, end up mm. getting. But you can now, for example, you can look at the difference in, in, in phase yeah. between signals. And you can, you can do post-processing to yeah. get within, <clears throat> if you will, to put it in and up processing, you can do a few centimeters. Yeah, and if you use differential GPS as well, where you have a reference sure. location, then you're down to the centimeters yeah. as well. Yeah. And in fact, we've actually got one of those gadgets in the university, differential GPS, yeah. <coughs> over in engineering. <coughs> yeah, and they work quite well. But the but the 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 situation that we've encountered here, and I think this is, I mean, from my point of view, one of the big um, issues in in or one of the big contributions, one of the main contributions in this, is that. There's a te there's a technology which is very the basic technology is very capable, but the implementations of it that are used have no hope of living of 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 getting towards the top of what it can do. It's a, but they're used as they are. There was a very interesting or a very interesting app that's been developed, which I have saw about six months ago. Someone had developed an app that you could put onto your smart device, smartphone. And the design of it, the purpose of it, was to help visually impaired people to go for walks by themselves. And the example that they used was, you get someone who's visually capable to set up the, the, the mapping and you know, the paths to follow and so on. And they were talking about going for a walk up the side of mountains in the Alps. And if you think about when you're walking along a path, the path is about a meter wide. And if you walk up the side of a mountain, you typically are going up a sort of snaky path. And often, you've, you've got to turn very sharply at a very specific point accurate to within less than a metre. Because if you go a bit further that way, it's too dear. That's 500 metres down, down the hillside. And it struck me, what we've already discovered is that that cannot be safe. Because a GPS in itself, under normal circumstances, in, I mean, in mountains, where you've probably only got part of the sky visible, you're going to have degraded accuracy. So is it ethical, reasonable to sell this app to people who want to go tap, 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 tap along the mountainside, <coughs> and you turn right, or turn 90 degrees, or 120 degrees in 5 metres, 3 metres, 2 metres, oh dear, I'm ever so sorry, you've just gone past it. That's not going to be very good. So we can we already be able to say that some of these things are very clever. Can I take you back to your, your students' data? It yeah. appeared that something happened eight or ten minutes after the, yeah. the experiment. Did you ever get a feel for what it was? <coughs> well, we by understanding the technologies, we kind of got a feel for the fact that each satellite is in a 12-hour orbit. And the constellation that you see repeats, I think it's every 12 or 24 hours. The Amazon was using, I think, an iPhone, I can't remember, but with the iPhone interface, you can't tell what the satellites are. With, the, with um, Android, there, the API allows you to identify all the satellites that are there. Whether it'll tell you which four or five or six actually been used, or whether it just uses everything you can see, I'm not sure. But one of the things I think is happening, and Dave is actually right, going to be writing a couple of little apps for us, one in iOS, one in Android, to be able to connect, collect location data plus the entire state data from the phone um, at specified intervals, whether one second or five seconds or ten seconds for a period of time, a gap, and so on. And one of the things we'll be trying to look at is, okay, if we put it outside somewhere and just set it to run every, take a reading every five seconds for, say, an hour, two hours, three hours, what are we seeing? And from the Android data, we're going to see, OK, here's the way that the stationary thing moves in 3D. Um, and we'll see these error blips. And we'll then be able to see what's happening to the um, satellite constellation that's actually visible or, or being used. So we'll be able to see things like that, I think, when, with the Android data. Apple won't tell us that lot. It'll tell us different things. But a lot of what you went into there is just bad implementation. <coughs> and by bad, I mean you know, GPS doing it properly. It's ex an extremely demanding, hard real-time mm. operation, which consumer hardware people are just not willing to spend well, money on. But that's why if you're running Maps Plus, which takes readings every second or two, it burns your battery, half yeah. the battery in about an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, because uh, yeah, because doing and even then that's not as good as it, as it could oh, be because no. doing doing real full on GPS is very com computationally very demanding. Mm. Which kind of makes sense. <coughs> it's it's hard, but it was designed to operate on you know diesel digital energy power ships. Mm. I mean, the stuff that um, Victor actually did, which was the M8 uh, HTC, <coughs> was how different implementations yeah. two years apart with different chip sets and maybe different, or probably different um, Android versions, different implementation capabilities. Yes. And so what I'd like to do. And it's even worse, different case, different, <coughs> different case equipment, different physical antenna design, yeah. different different techniques for manufacturing the circuit board that connects the antenna to oh, it's, it's I mean, that's why I'm hoping that the guy who's doing the orientation, he may or may not get around to having getting the circuit diagram with all the disassembled uh, pictures to see where the set of the uh, antennae are. And whether I mean he, this would be something to do with the um, electronics guys perhaps yeah. is get them to have a look at interaction between the mobile phones uh, antenna antenna and the GPS antenna. Uh, another thing that happens in sat navs, which may or may not happen in one of these is they have an inertial guidance system. They've got accelerometers and so on, which is why when you go into Birmingham from Spaghetti Junction and you go into the tunnels, the sat nav keeps you nicely on the road and at about the right point. So it knows how fast you're going. So you've got just why again the sat navs in vehicles is quite useful. To it integrates that. So one of the things we might be trying to do is see whether. Whether there are uh, APIs which allow us to get the state data of the accelerometer out of these in one way or another, maybe we'll just have to see what we can do. Whether we integrate it over a second, who knows? To try and get rid of the, the jitter. In cars, are even worse. I mean, um, some people, you know, the the car knows how fast it's going. So if the sat nav is an integral part of the car, it can easily make use of all that information. But if you, but then again, if you have, if it isn't part of the car, oh, yeah, sure, yeah, then yeah. it's probably got a much more accurate velocity than your car, which is fairly unreliable. It's probably ten percent adrift anyway, or four to five percent. Cars are required by law to indicate faster than you're oh, actually driving. Yeah. <laughs> but but what what the actual signals that appear on the internal cars? Ah, not not necessarily that mirrors that to what it says. But of course, those are 100% dependent upon having the right size tires. Yeah, at the right inflation, at the right inflation, and everything. Uh, but it's so probably good enough to be for the tunnel. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 All the sat, all the inertials. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else, folks? Yeah. Can we turn that off? Any, yeah. Anyone prepared to throw any money at it? We've got. Um, a possible yeah. opera, uh, joint work with the simple charity. answer is yes. Uh, the simple answer is yes. But we've also got another another black opportunity which we haven't mentioned here is a local charity who has a single worker problem. People are going out for a day, visiting potentially dangerous environments, either uh, dangerous because they could fall down a hole because they're in the countryside, or because there are angry clients that are visiting. Um, they've had various attempts at getting an app. So they know where their uh, staff are if they press the panic button or they just disappear off the air. Um, and so we'll, we'll, this is going very desultorily because the guy who's wanting the work done is very, very busy running the charity. And uh, so it's, um, and we really need to have this uh, app that Dave is writing so we can still work out how frequently do you need to switch. How quickly do you, or how frequently do you need to switch location services on, and for how long to get a reasonably accurate measurement? Um, but the answer is not going to be pure technology. There will still have to be human procedure processes because if you've got three visits in four in three houses down the road um, within 25, 30 meters of each other, it's going to be incredibly difficult without. Uh, right, guys, I'm now leaving number 25. I'm going to 27. And I don't mind where it says I am, I'm in 27. So there's going to be a sort of combined sort of governance and technology solution, I think. Good. Um, just, uh, uh, is, is there a degradation over the years, do you think, um, you know, in terms of um, basically, well, recording and uh, other aspects of the, of the processing of the signal? I'm just interested. Back in the 1990s, I was just checking it up here at the moment, 
GPS mesh uh, was a, a GPS system for uh, meteorological use and atmospheric conditions and so on. And I was using it a bit uh, back in the 1990s uh, for uh, in the astronomy context of atmospheric uh, yeah. uh, seeing, uh, etc. But uh, at least back in those days it was. I think regarded that GPS signals would be very, very beneficial and uh, you know, to the extent of basically being able to monitor um, uh, laminar uh, uh, contexts in, in, in the atmosphere and so on. Uh, and um, uh, I'm just wondering, would you judge from what you're doing that uh, there could well be a, a worsening of the situation? By the way, my galaxy fame, the other day, I, I was, I think, towards London, and it was showing me Northumbria or something on it. Mad. Yeah, it does that. Um, now, I, I, if we look at, well, we've only got one set of data which compares two generations of the same manufacturer, HTC. Uh, what I hope we can do, subject to sort of solving some of the privacy issues, is to get, once we've got these apps tuned up and working appropriately, we'd like to put them out, I'd like to put them out on um, the app stores for people who want to sign up can sign up and we'll do some sort of curious one-way hashing to sort of anonymize the origin and so on. And then just get it fed in large quantities uh, from around the world into a server that we can set up here and then build up something to duplicate and exceed what um, the Microsoft GeoLife data set is about, but with the specific intention that if people want to help us, they can either do journey type data or they can provide us with long time series at a single point so they can tell us what the actual point really is and then we can watch how the not just the differential internal consistency varies but okay this is where it was at this altitude xyz and we can just see the whole journey over a period of a, a, a day perhaps and one thing i'd like to do is you know, just plug it in permanently into it and just leave two of them running one with a cover on like i have this sort of that's all, that's all one of these will come. From what Dave is saying, if that makes it get warmer, then if I put, say, kept it like that on the table, and I had another identical one, which I've got a pair of five C's at home, one with a cover and one without, is there a statistical difference after you've got 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 readings? I mean, that number of readings should give you some sensible statistics even at the sixth decimal place of the location, which is eight centimetres worth. So, yeah, there's lots of things we can still do. Okay. Uh, thanks all very much. It's two minutes to one, so uh, thanks for being here.